Recording has started. Hey, thank you, everybody. This is the October 18th meeting of the W3C WebRTC Working Group. We have two hours together today. We abide by the W3C patent policy, and only companies and people that are listed on this status webpage are allowed to make substantive contributions. So today we're going to cover encoded transform, media capture extensions, WebRTC PC, WebRTC extensions, and capture handle. We have two meetings before the end of the year. One is November 15th and December 6th, so please keep those in mind. I guess it's a total of only four hours together uh, other than this meeting. So if we need other meetings, probably it'd be a good time to, to think that through and, and plan it. Uh, so a little bit about this meeting. A link to the slides is published on the wiki. We do need a scribe to take meeting notes. Do we have a volunteer? I'll take care of it. Oh, thank you, Don. Okay, and uh, we are recording, so the recording will be public. We operate under the Code of Conduct, the W3C Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. We're all passionate about approving Robert C, but let's try to keep it cordial and professional. Uh, we'll be managing the queue, I guess the speaker, or Harold, will you do that? Uh, we'll have the plus queue and minus queue in Google Meet chat if you want to get into the speaker queue, and please use headphones or a echo canceling speakerphone. Uh, you'll have to handle your microphone, obviously, after you uh, get called on and give us your full name. I'm not sure we'll use polls, but if we do, uh, we can gauge a sense of the room. Just a uh, note about document status. There's been some misunderstandings. Just because something's in the repo doesn't mean it's been adopted. That's a separate thing. We use the CFA process. Uh, editor's process may not represent consensus, but the working group uh, drafts do. All right, so here's the agenda for today. Um, we have encoded transform, Harold, uh, media capture extensions, briefly, Henrik, um, Weber CPC, Oberfield from TPAC, Yanni Bar will handle that. Florent will do some more about to see extensions issues, and then we'll have capture handle. And we'll try to manage the time uh, so that we can give everyone the, their allocation. All right. So, Harold, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, I looked at the minutes from uh, TPAC and found that they were very consistent with us discussing packet level API as a concept, and um, we did manage to assign AIs for writing explainer use cases and architectural descriptions, none of which have been executed on, I think. But um, there were a number of other issues that uh, were in the slide deck, but that I never got to. So in the interest of making progress on all issues. Let's take the other ones here. Next. So, two issues that we have filed on the packetization order. The, the problem is that packets don't arrive in order on the network. Sometimes they're lost, sometimes we ask for retransmissions. And that means that some frames might turn up at the API and before they actually before uh, frames that that uh, should have come earlier. So decoders, codecs must have frames in order because uh, they depend on each other. So there's a reordering in front of the if in front of the decoder step. And when you transform things, it's of course simplest if the decoding happens, if you if you can get them in, in decode order, because that makes things kind of obvious. But uh, this means that you have to have a JT buffer in front of the transformer. And so that means again that if your transformer introduces jitter, there's nothing that compensates for that afterwards. <laughs> Sorry. So 
the current uh, Chrome implementation has the jitter buffer after the transformer, which means that we sometimes get frames out of order. But uh, we have talked about this earlier and said that we, it's uh, rare enough that uh, we should have frames up in order. So we should pick one and stick with it and write tests for it. So uh, let's discuss. I have Bernard on the queue. Uh, yes, Harold. This isn't the only um, place where we encounter this problem. So I'm wondering, are you thinking that there would be the jitter buffer would somehow be explicit in the API? Because um, certainly, you know, what WD streams can handle frames that are out of order. I mean, they have to be. I assume they'll be reassembled. They'll just be out of order. Is that the idea? They'll be complete frames where they're just not in the right order. Right. Yeah, I mean, you could handle the jitter buffer, I guess, as kind of a transform stream that you could offer to the app. Is that what you're thinking? No, oh, I'm actually thinking that uh, <coughs> we have three choices. We can say uh, frames arrive in whatever order they arrive in. We can say the, the browser must uh, reorder frames so that uh, they arrive in order, including waiting for the, for the lost frame, which doesn't sound good. And we should have a flag that allows us to control which, uh, which of the two, two first alternatives that uh, we want, that the app, app wants. Uh, UN. Yeah, I, I think we, we discussed that in the past. And uh, if if I remember correctly, we thought that uh, in order was what uh, web developers were expecting, basically. And uh, I agree that it, it's, it might make um, user agent Im implementers life more difficult. But in, in um, but uh, yeah, so, I would think that we should look at use cases where um, having out of order would would be a benefit, and uh, we we know that out of order is a is a potential food gun, and uh, if we see use cases where out of order would be good to have, um, then we should try to to find a solution there. But if we do not have use cases for uh, out of order given we know it's a food gun and web developers will not account for it, uh, we should stick with in order, like we have currently in the spec. Bernard? Yeah, I guess uh, my, my question is for the kind of crypto we're using, can you even do it out of order? For like S-Frame, it? yes. Yeah, for S-Frame, I, I guess you can, you can do it. The issue might be, um, like uh, the counter, like the SRAM counter uh, might not be incrementally uh, increasing, monotonically increasing, and uh, maybe some uh, JavaScript will say, oh, there's something weird there, so we'll drop frames and so on. Uh, right. But for, for the pure decryption and so on, it should not be an issue. So is the, is the goal here just a speed? It's a speed issue, like it's faster if you get me the stuff out of order? That, uh... And so the so uh, I I joined the queue to say that uh, as participants, uh, my worry about uh, in order is that it's the case where a frame is lost, and uh, and where you don't have NAC or you don't have RTX, and so at some point you have to give up waiting for it. So. Uh, when uh, if if we accept uh, that frames have to be in order, then we also accept that uh, lost frames will cause a delay of some magnitude, but we have no idea what that magnitude is. 
the app will have no idea what that magnitude is. So it, uh, it kind of worries me that if we have used cases that are, that are in a hurry, uh, lost frames will cause um, a strange delay. Dom is on the queue. Yeah, I guess it could be instead of picking in Good. order and out of order, it could be always in order, but with some kind of uh, developer configurable timeout after which you simply assume the frame lost. And so that way the developer have control about how much delay they might introduce uh, without uh, having them to re-implement the reordering of the time either. Mm. Tony? Uh, you end this first. Yeah, um, I, I think that having the option is appealing from web developer point of view, but in terms of uh, implementation, it might be uh, quite difficult to, to have both options. So we, we should try to just have one and not two. Um, I think in general, it's the, the potential issue might be if uh, the transform is like sometimes taking uh, a few milliseconds and sometimes taking uh, a long time. And and then uh, it's true that uh, a data buffer after might, might be beneficial. But in practice, for what we are thinking, uh, like decryption or uh, like getting some metadata and then passing the, the data to the decoders and so on, it should be fairly stable and fairly, fairly linear. So I, I'm not sure we we are uh, getting much from uh, a G, from getting the detail buffer after. Yeah, seems like uh, this, this this one has to be to be done with use cases, and uh, I suggest we skip skip ahead to the next slide. Uh, I was this still on the queue. Oh, <laughs> um, no, I think I was going to say a related thing of if we are moving the jitter buffer to before the transform, then that is kind of a material impact of either we wait longer earlier or we do increase packet loss because you don't have the extra duration of whatever the transform is doing to be able to wait for these out of order packets. Um, and uh, kind of a separate point. Um, we are going to have some risk of jitter being introduced during the transform because we're just on like a normal web worker, right? It's not like we're on a real-time worklet, so there could be scheduling delays there, GC, um, other kinds of delays that are out of control of the web developer. I have so, one additional comment, maybe, which is that um, so currently Chrome and Safari implementation, uh, since it's uh, the same backend there, are out of order. So the question is, uh, we have implementations that are not matching the specification. So is Chrome planning to switch to in order or not? That's also a good question, because uh, if implementations will never align, then uh, we need also to take that into account. So I think we can say for Chrome that uh, we have no plans to switch to in order, and, and it would require a comp compelling argument to make us do so. That's why we have this discussion to find out if there is compelling argument. Jan Ivar. Yes, I just wanted to make the point that uh, unless the transform has side effects, it doesn't seem why it would matter much uh, we're talking about it taking too long if we have a jitter better for ahead of time, but uh, it's not going to affect the. I mean, if you're just uh, decoding, it, it shouldn't really matter unless there's a transform use cases that are time dependent in other ways, and that maybe it's rerouting the information somewhere else or something. So, use cases would definitely be appreciated. Uh, otherwise, I think. Uh, uh, having a simpler API without a foot gun is the way to go. Without a foot gun, you mean uh, in order? In order, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm or, not clear. Uh, if is, someone is could spell out the advantages of, of the it's other. It's out of order of the foot gun, because it's not clear to me. 
Well, I don't know what the foot gun is of in order. That seems to be, if you're just going to decode, not having to, having more invariance, you don't have to worry about reordering. Why would you want to worry about reordering? What is the gain? What do you gain? So when, the, you, when you say we do it earlier, mm -hmm. do it what earlier? That's sort of what I'm after. So the, the foot gun in, uh, in uh, no reordering is uh, variable delay. So if delay matters, that's a foot gun. If ordering matters, that's the other foot can. So which foot do you want to shoot? Variable delay, but it's going to be delayed anyway. So if you transform, there's going to be a jitter buffer after you, right? Well, there might. Yeah, I think Depending we need there. to move off of uh, this issue to the next one. Yeah. <laughs> so use cases is, is uh, the action item from this one. So, so generate keyframe for, for both sides, right? Or for just for yeah. the no order case. Yeah. Okay. So generate keyframe. So this we had a discussion at TPAC about generate keyframe, but uh, in particular, FIPO wanted to uh, revisit the issue because they thought that uh, I think just. Philip, I think you said that the answer was uh, that the 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 argument was not presented well for for needing uh, partial keyframes. So Philip, no, we you... didn't. We did not get to the fourth proposal because that was added to the slides very very late. Hmm. So the fourth proposal is to that. It agrees with the consensus at TPAC that the return value should be empty, but it also allows the application to pass any subsets of the RITs into generate keyframe, which, if you want keyframes for just two layers, avoids splitting that up into two calls from the main thread to the encoder. So it uh, so the uh, if I remember rightly, that would mean that the encoder will take the decision on to generate either for just those reads or possibly some more reads that it would have to do because of internal structures. Correct. Some encoders can generate keyframes for individual reads; others cannot do that. It depends on the codec. So if you if you only have that part kind of codec, there would be no difference between the no argument thing and the the argument list. So the argument list API would seem to be strictly more powerful without uh, uh, imposing a burden on implementers uh, that uh, have problems supporting it. Is but there any I argument why we shouldn't pass this value? You mean not passing a list of reads instead of just a single read? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have an implementation which does multiple reads and it works for mm -hmm. some codecs. I think so, that, uh, you went. Yeah, I, I think at TPAC we we said that uh, one read was good enough and it was simple enough and that, that, that was uh, uh, good enough. It seems that there, there's no use case for uh, being sure that uh, two uh, levels will actually hit the same, uh, the same frame. Uh, it seems that the use case is more like uh, if I'm calling the API twice with two, two, two values, then maybe I will uh, sometimes create two keyframes for all the reads, and sometimes I will not do that. Uh, and it's uh, it's a bit more convenient to, in that case, to pass uh, two, two values. I'm not really convinced by this argument at all, because I think at the end of the day, uh, the web application will need to know whether its encoder is uh, uh, creating um, uh, 
um, keyframes for a particular read or for all reads anyway, because uh, if you do not know that, you will not be able to uh, actually do a good heuristic of when calling this API. But uh, on the other hand, the, it's, uh, it's a minor complexity to add uh, a list. Uh, so it's not like uh, a big deal for me uh, either way. So I hear a, a medium strong objection to sing, single value, and I hear a no 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 strong objection to to an array uh, argument. Should I go with the array argument? Going once, going twice. It's an array. I can do the pull request. Thank you. So next slide. Uh, MIME type. So payload type is uh, already part of the API. And, and uh, the bad thing about the payload type is that in order to, to figure out what it means, you have to be able to parse SDP and uh, and figure out what was actually negotiated. And uh, that's a pain in the posterior. But uh, the, the browser always knows which MIME type is associated with which payload type. So if the browser knows and, uh, and, the, and the transform needs to know, why not just tell it? So let me see. Uh, now I have uh, FIPO and UN on the queue, I think. Yes. So the argument for adding that is also that currently we don't describe or specify how the data is structured. The encoded frame. That's currently very format specific, and adding a MIME type would allow us to specify the data as depending on the MIME type. You win? Uh, I was asking for use case, <laughs> and I, I think people provided one. Uh, it's it's not a big deal. I, I think we already, uh, in some structure, exposed both the MIME type and the payload type, right? So maybe there's a pattern there as well. So that seems fine. We expose it in statistics, yes. OK. So I think that uh, we, we can have a resolution that uh, people can, yep. Um, isn't the uh, uh, data available also in get parameters? You should be able to have the list of uh, prototypes, I believe, there. If you have the peer connection available. Right. Exactly. It's diff more difficult than workers. Right. OK. I just wanted to make sure that uh, that was considered. OK. If it is. It's... OK. So uh, FIPO will go ahead and write the PR. Sounds good. Next, RTP sequence numbers. <laughs> What's the use case here? Um, the use case is very similar to this one-ended transform that you talked about at TPAC. We have a custom decoder that would that does rely on the RTP sequence number to detect losses in the audio. And for audio, it's relatively easy to add that to incoming frames. For video, it's much more complicated, and it is more complicated for outgoing frames as well. And so when for incoming audio, you basically have one RTP packet uh, resulting in one, uh, one set of samples, and it's a transform. That's Great. the assumption. 
So get, getting back to a previous issue for in order or out of order, this would uh, this would expose that. And if people start to use uh, the sequence number to say, hey, this packet has been lost uh, and we are not doing in order, then they might receive it later on and they might be confused and so on. Uh, I, I think for this particular issue, it's fine uh, to, to expose it. But uh, it's the more we expose that kind of stuff, the, the more we in order might be, uh, might be better. Well, for our use case, we actually have our custom jitter buffer in JavaScript and are not using anything in the transform or after the transform. We don't re enqueue the frame into the pipeline. So that so that would be actually a use case for a use case for the for the out of order thing because you have your own data buffer. I can try to get a write up on that as input to the other discussion. Good. So is it okay to just just expose this for in, inbound audio frames? That would add it to the metadata as a, as as a, a not non non required dictionary member, so that it can it can be just missing for the other cases. Let's see. And Neva joined the queue and then left it. So I think. No further comments? Let's just do this. Well, uh, Next sorry, point. maybe I should have, um, sorry, since I was on the queue for a little second there. Um, I'm just, my one concern is uh, to, to clarify the use cases, uh, because if we're adding metadata that makes no sense in the traditional transform case, I think we should be a, a bit skeptical. Uh, and I'd like to understand the larger use case of these uh, one-ended transforms. That's my feedback. Philip, can you take the action item to write up the use case? I think you already said yes. Will do. Good. So action, action item is to write up use case and pull request, and then we'll approve it. So the resolution remains that we do add the second name to the dictionary as an optional member. Or is that pending the, the use case? I think we should merge the use case first, yes. Okay. So uh, we're at um, um, five, uh, one minute past the hour. I put in a slide for the packetization API which uh, kind of, and if we had time and we have four minutes, three minutes left, any more comments on the, on, on the practitization API apart from what came up at TPEC? There, there seems to be some simple thing like MTU that we could, we could do first and that So add MTU to the to the uh, frame API. You mean? We lost your end. That's all. Oh, too bad. Philip is in the queue. Philip, right. So for MTU is mostly an issue for audio. And I don't think we really hit, in practical cases, the MTU limit with the redundancy ever. That would mean a redundancy level of eight or nine, and that is far out from what I've seen in practice. But it is an issue if you have transforms that do change size largely. But red isn't a good example for that. So, Yuan, since you're back, can you can you tell us uh, 
that you want to add the MTU to the to the frame level API? Uh, no, I, I don't think it, it deserves to be in the frame level API. That, that does not really make sense. It would more add the context level. Uh, something like you have a value, and whenever it changes, you you might have an event, and you you get it from there. Uh, that would be the typical uh, API surface that we we, we would use, because a frame is uh, unrelated to it's 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 uh, coming from uh, the encoder, right? So it it doesn't have any MTU information there. Oh yes, the encoder has has MTU information, but it's the information it has is that I am I am uh, doing the default. Sorry. And so, otherwise, nothing else there. We have action items to perform. I think we should give the give the give the half a minute to the next section. All right, let's talk about track frame rates. So with uh, <clears throat> get settings, uh, track dot get settings dot frame rate, you can tell the configured frame rate, but you can't tell the actual frame rate. And well, what is the actual frame rate? It, it can mean different things depending on where in the pipeline you measure it. So uh, the camera may produce less frames because of the lightning conditions where the frames never even created or the frame may be dropped prior to being delivered to the sink. For example, if you have performance issues, or it can drop later. But I think all, all frame counters are of interest. The settings was produced and what's what I call emitted from the track. Uh, we want both the camera frame rate and we want to know about frame drops. There are some APIs already um that measure frame rates at different points so for example rq picker connection get stats has the frame counter which i think is a bit under specified but it's implemented as the input frame to webrtc or you could look at the uh, html media element like uh, playback metrics and get uh, the frames being rendered <clears throat> i guess but there's issues with these apis and uh, alternatives uh, and that is that the measurements are happening later in the pipeline. Uh, so they're not, if a frame is dropped, you know, as soon as it's been produced, it's likely not going to be covered here. And also uh, ergonomics, it's, it's uh, I, I think it's bad if, if like a non-web RTC use case would be forced to use an RTC peer connection uh, like a dummy peer connection just for the sake of getting a metric from a track like if it's track specific uh, that's my uh, argument and um I'll, I'll go to the so there's one more slide i'll go to the slide with the proposal and then we can do questions but <clears throat> my proposal is that we add the frame counter apis uh, to the track directly call me bias but i think get stats is a, is a beautiful name for this api <laughs> So get stats would return uh, the frames captured, you know, produced by camera, for example, and frames emitted, which are the frames that weren't dropped. And when I say that it's uh, emitted, I mean that it's being passed over to a sync. So it's a it's a frame that was neither dropped, muted, dis dis uh, disabled, discarded. Uh, and the asterisk is frame drops could still happen later. For example, if you're passing it to WebRTC uh the frame could get dropped uh, after encoding before but before sending or or whatever like if you're rendering it it might get dropped before getting rendered because reasons but that's outside the scope of this api which is only concerned with from the source to the track and let's go to questions so i think Juan is first um yes so I think that all APIs that are using uh, a media stream track uh, will allow you to to get uh, the number of frames that you are actually receiving. Like if you're using uh, media capture transform, you will get the, all the, the count of frames that you're using. If you're using WebRTC, it's the same. If you're using a video element, it's the same. So this part is solved. 
like at the what same level it's... you have roughly uh the amount of frames you, you you want and it seems that what you want is um uh there's the sink and there's the source and in in between there might be uh some drop and you you might want to 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 get additional information between the two um which seems to be like the frames captured uh thing so maybe it's fine to have it uh I, i'm not sure i understand the difference between frames captured and, and frames emitted uh and it seems to me that uh it, it might be very specific to a given pipeline and in the spec we have a source and we have sinks and uh the source if it's producing a frame uh will emit it in, in practice so i'm not sure it will be very easy to specify uh frames emitted in uh in uh com in a web compatible in a, an interoperable way uh so that's that's why i would i would try to decorate the two maybe and uh discuss maybe frames captured first and see whether there's a consensus and then uh as a follow-up discuss frames emitted which might be uh, harder that that might make sense actually because um like frames captured is the big missing piece in my mind frames emitted is a is a nice bonus but like you said you can get uh, if you if you webrc is is your uh, your sync you can you can look at the input frame rate and it would should be the same uh, more questions yeah. john Ever? Uh, so please please uh, be short because we allocated very little time for this one it was a late addition anyway yes yeah, so i i would say for frames captured i have uh some uh understand you know i think that makes some sense because the use case is a camera and low lighting and the current uh constraint does not give you those measurements which i guess we could revisit that would be one option um for frames emitted i share un's concern is that i don't think i think that's implementation defined and i'm not sure that's actually observable and that the and uh, some concerns I heard in what it might, when it might produce lower numbers would be include some implementations might not produce a frame if the sync doesn't want it. So then you have a downstream issue where you're, you're not measuring upstream, you're sort of, and this is the problem with track, right? It's supposed to represent the source, but it's also a modifier. Um, and I, if, if the problem is that, you know, you set a frame rate, so it's decimating frame rates, hopefully user agents are uh, good enough at decimating that there's uh, not going to be that much difference from the configured value. But for for low light, uh, I have uh, uh, it makes more sense. Uh, as for a new get stats method, um, yeah, maybe, or maybe we could put it as a constraint. Um, Bernard, yeah, I was just going to ask what the next step is for this, because I think we're out of time. I, I so I think frames captured in some form where we can discuss where to place it, but that seems to be thumbs up ish and frames emitted uh, thumbs down or revisited in the future. I think Does that make sense. So uh, I, I I joined the queue to say to say that I think that frames emitted makes some sense because it's consistent across uh, APIs, but uh, I can see the argument that. Uh, that this this is the same value as what you would uh, have exposed from other APIs. Well, if it's the same value, that would be nice to expose to. But uh, let's uh, consider frames captured accepted and uh, and frames submitted. That's uh, st still uh, st uh, still up for discussion. Not ad not adopted. And split it up into two PRs. Yep. Sounds good. Yaniva, you have. 20 minutes for WebRTC PC issues. All right, uh, simulcast. Um, the story continues. So we got four issues uh, to discuss. So next slide. So this is the uh, same slide as, uh, or spillover slide from last TPAC. This was the, uh, the wing we choked on uh, quite early. Um, so this was to do with uh, RID lengths. Uh, if you put in 17 character RIDs, uh, most browsers will choke on it, except Firefox. And uh, the, the spec relies on other uh, specs 
to define things uh, in ITF. The RFC 8851 still allows 256 octets. But in practice, people use single character RIDs because anything bigger bloats the RTP header. So we still, I think this working group still would like to try to limit RIDs to 16 characters uh, for web combat at this point. Next slide. Uh, we had some uh, progress uh, because there's some other differences like uh, uh, an errata was published, uh, I should say, on RFC 8851, where um, uh, minus and underscore are no longer valid characters, so yay. Uh, restricting the feedback we got from uh, people who posted this errata was that restricting size to 16 instead of 255 would might be hard to justify as an erratum, uh, but it might be doable in abyss. And for people who are not familiar with ITF, Lingo, don't feel bad. I don't know what a business either. I'm sure it'll be great. And it'll tell you that if you go with 16 plus characters, you'll discover a path of pain and it's it's uh, a new draft. It's a new draft which probably people aren't gonna do. So. Right. So uh, so the the lingo is that eighty eight fifty one bis is uh, the successor to eighty eight fifty one until it gets an RFC number. Right. So I'm, I'm just uh, the slide is basically to then say that uh, next steps that we think are the way to go is to try a biz to say less than 16 characters. And there's a remaining question of empty string, which I think we can just fix in WebRTC PC and basically say, uh, as a JavaScript input API, if we get an empty string, you have not provided a read. So the one Any star objections? means that it has to have, have at least one character. So it's already outlawed. Oh. Yeah. I missed that. Thank you. A ABM in that case, has, has interesting squiggles on it. Yeah. Uh, this is great. So in that case, I think the remaining is just an update that we want to try to do a bit on this. And we can go to the next slide. All right. So this is a, a real issue that we fired, so, found in sorry, Firefox trying to implement. Yenira. Sorry, yes. I'm confused. Are we going to do any? size limitation then, or is it le left to the RFC to be updated? But I remain confused about the fact that we in our JS API can't say we don't want to produce reads that are, or we don't want to let developers produce reads that are a bad idea. Well, I suppose we could make a decision that we don't allow more than 16 characters in our API. Um, there was some pushback last meeting about uh, specifying uh, limitations on RID uh, that weren't reflected in ITF specs. So I guess we're trying to do the right thing uh, in this case, but I'm, I'm open to other options. So let me ask then, uh, are Chrome and Safari going to allow up to 256 characters? Because uh, at the end of the day, the specs only matter until the implementation match what the spec says. And so if the so implementations are not going to match RFC 8851 in that sense, and I don't know that really makes It should be possible oh. to update uh, Chrome uh, to support um, all the characters that we want and as many characters as we want. Uh, it was not done uh, originally because we didn't have uh, two bytes header extensions. And uh, so we felt like it was safer to just allow up to 16 characters. But now that it has shipped in Chrome and uh, it should be possible to do uh if we think that's the right thing and if people don't want to use it which we probably shouldn't then uh, they don't have to use it so we have not had any use case that uh, that where uh, 17 characters seems necessary right it seems to me uh if if we're going with 16 characters uh, we, we should add a note in, in, in our WebRTCPC spec that, hey, this is the current limitation and we are trying to push it to the IETF RFC. And when the RFC is updated, then we can remove the note. But still, it's good to uh, describe it somewhere. And uh, this somewhere, it's easier in WebRTCPC right now. So uh, it makes sense to do it in WebRTCPC first if we can do it. One option might also be uh, we have a separate decision on the add transceiver uh, interface, 
And uh, a separate question for what to accept in incoming offers and answers, I guess. Be nice if they align though. Hmm. In order to and, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just echoing what UN said. I think it should be a non-normative note just to note that uh, you know typically more than 16 won't be accepted. Well, but uh, it can't be non-normative if there is going to be an error uh, when you do more than 16. And again, personally, I, I feel <laughs> that limiting it at 16 is absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, but it, it is normative behavior if one browser is going to accept 17 and the other isn't. Um, I mean, uh, my sense is that the protocol says it's legal to send 256 characters. That doesn't mean that any implementation should allow to let developers do something silly like that. So I, I think limiting what we allow in a transceiver, I don't think is goes against uh, the protocol. I, I fully agree that in terms of what we accept from SDP, we I, mean, I hope we still already allow for that, because uh, that's what the protocol asks. Um, but yeah, in terms of our API, I, I don't think there is anything bad in saying such a silly idea. We, we are not going to let you do that. There is no point. Right, so, um, but then you end up with an API where you can only create 16 characters through JavaScript, but you can do more from remote offers, so. All right, uh, we're out of time on this issue, I think. So, um, uh, next issue, um, the uh, spec says right now that um, set remote description with an offer to receive simulcast has actually always said that it overrides uh, sending codings. But with uh, our latest update, we've relaxed it a little bit uh, to clarify that it only overrides sending codings that don't have writs in them. So that's an improvement uh, based on uh, what was considered a bug before. So the current language is that um, if the length of uh, sending codings is one and the loan encoding contains no writ member, then we overwrite it with simulcast. And this, I think, makes sense uh, because um, the opposite would be to try to preserve some of the unicast parameters in the simulcast array. And that seems like a poor choice because unicast and simulcast arrays aren't super compatible, specifically because the, the lone unicast entry, for, in, for instance, usually you would have scale resolution down by one. Whereas if you have simulcast, <clears throat> the first encoding is usually the smallest. So um, it seems better if you get an offer to receive simulcast, now you're doing simulcast and you, you have your previous unicast settings uh, overwritten. <clears throat> now, so that would mean that um, if you roll it back, it would have to undo that overwrite, basically by overwriting again. Now, rollback in offset remote description is rare. It's not used in perfect negotiation. So um, principle of at least astonishment would seem to be that if you if you roll back the overwrite, uh, it undoes the overwrite, basically. And that means it also would undo any modifications you had done after the overwrite, if that makes sense. So if you, uh, because these methods can be you know, JavaScript can call them in, in lots of interesting orders. And one of them is uh, you get an offer to receive simulcast. You then call set parameters to modify all simulcast attributes, and then you roll it back. And I think most people would not expect those simulcast settings to then survive the rollback of simulcast. So the proposal is to clarify this. Any objections? Seems good. Anything that right. uh, ends up, uh, as long as the ro rollback ends up with the same thing as you started with before rollback, it seems right. Right. OK, good. Uh, next question. <clears throat> All right, so another issue uh, with the PR is um, that modifications to send encodings from set parameters and uh, negotiation methods can be racy. Uh, so 
our set parameters API is a read and st store modif uh, modify API, and that you read settings, and then you modify them, and you set them uh, <clears throat> asynchronously. So there's a time gap here where this process of read and store back may race with the negotiation methods. Specifically, a remote offer to receive simulcast overrides the read free send encodings array, which we just discussed, uh, a rollback of the above, which we just agreed to, and uh, also answers may prune all but one read encoding from send encodings. Um, so what happens when this raises with set parameters? What outcome would we want? We'd probably want the result we'd have gotten had set parameters been allowed to complete first. So the proposal is to let set parameters complete first. Uh, we do a similar thing for ad track uh, when ad track is racing with set remote description. So this uh, picture shows adding a third sentence here that basically says if any promises from set parameters methods on the sender associated with connection are not settled, abort these, step, abort these steps and start the process over, which is language uh, similar to the bullet two above that we do for ad track. Should this be guarded by if remote is true? Um, there's a case uh, for this being too broad. I, I would have to, a, a local description, set local description answer may also print reads. So it would have to cover that. So it'd have to be if remote is true or it's an answer. We could do that. I can update the PR. So, I have a question. Henrik? If if you uh, if you restart, like something happens in between and then you restart and apply the steps again, wouldn't you basically implicitly roll back anything that changed by the uh, in parallel uh, operation? Like the SDP modifies the parameters, but because you're setting doing set parameters. Again, I mean, the set parameters is probably a modification of an earlier get parameters. So to do this correctly, you'd have to wait until the SDP is applied, then call get, get parameters again, and then do set parameters. But that requires a manual restart rather than applying it again. So I'm not sure what, so, what would change in the SDP. So uh, we did consider, so this is steps before we run the success callback. So the success callback would not happen at this point. And it, it would have to basically, the, our intent was to try to wait until the set parameters have settled. So we don't want to try to reapply set parameters afterwards. We want to get them all done ahead of time so that there are no outstanding set parameters and solve the race that way, which would which uh, seems to be close to what would have happened uh, had the uh, remote description come in just a tiny bit later. Oh, yes. So is, is set parameters being applied before the SDP is processed or after the SDP yes. is processed? Yes, before the SDP is processed. OK, that makes sense. That way, if it was unicast before, then set parameters is unicast, and it gets to finish before it becomes simulcast, and vice versa in a rollback. And if set parameters make it simulcast, then, then uh, the method will will fail or whatever. Well, it will never fail. So if you do set parameters, if you have simulcast right now and you modify simulcast, it'll say you'll get a promise to say your simulcast parameters were set. And shortly after, you know, there'll be an answer or something that removes those encodings again and you're back to unicast. So um, okay. And that seems to fit our model. All right. So uh, <clears throat> we also have issue 2762 uh, that contained uh, some of my research on what implementations are doing, that they generally don't fail in a lot of cases, and that we thought that seemed good. Uh, from last uh, month, we did merge a PR that has moved the spec halfway towards what implementations are doing, but not all the way. And basically, uh, the it used to the spec used to say set remote description of uh, offers that try to modify read negotiation at all would fail. And that wasn't really compliant with JSEP. Uh, right now it says that, so basically this PR relaxed it a bit. 
now all it says if none of the encodings in in the uh, what's been negotiated before contains a RID member whose value matches any of the RIDs in the simulcast attribute, then fail the process. So it's a much more lax description that uh, an SFU basically has to at least acknowledge uh, one RID value that was previously negotiated, and that. Uh, basically means that a change in RID value is tolerated as long as at least one RID matches uh, what was previously negotiated, or the offer is to no longer receive simulcast. So you can actually, uh, and then that mismatched or out of order RIDs effectively result in layer removal by existing language in the answer. Um, now, so this doesn't, um, so this relaxation of offer validation satisfies JSEP while simultaneously maintaining an existing spec invariant that layer pruning of encodings only happens in answers. This is different from implementations uh, that actually expose layer removal and have remote offer. The problem is that all those implementations also fail to roll back that information. Um, so those, it seems- All those implementations need fixing. Yes, <clears throat> so, the, so basically the idea is to uh, go this far but no further <clears throat> uh, because by waiting to the answer the nice thing is jsep already ensures that answers are within the envelope of the offer so when the sfu gives the browser an offer the browser is in full control of the answer and can deal with rid removal at that time and i think that makes sense <clears throat> it protects these existing invariants and it, it gives us the uh, nice uh, behavior that uh, Things can start out as simulcast until you get an offer to receive simul. So, sorry, things can start out as unicast, and then can be promoted to simulcast. At which point, uh, layers can be reduced back to one, uh, which effectively brings you back to unicast. But now it has a RID member in it. It means it can't be promoted back to simulcast. So it's a one-way street basically. That you can you can. Add as many layers as you want on initial negotiation of simulcast, and then um, you can prune layers down, prune yourself back to unicast. But you can't restart. The, there's no loophole that you can then. Uh, if if we had removed the red member, then basically that would be a loophole that would allow you to then expand the envelope again. So we're we're closing in on the end of time for this section. I don't mind right. requisition time to discuss this. OK. But um, in that case, uh, next slide. <coughs> um, continues the story here. Uh, this is the existing pruning language in set local description answer, uh, where I made a slight tweak of, instead of offered, we say previously negotiated. And uh, this clarifies uh, the way it, uh, some of implementations are working already, uh, but at the wrong time in the offer, is that uh, we allow um, we allow removing of uh, all but the uh, first encoding. But that description is also. But that description, if it's missing any of the previously negotiated layers, we remove those dictionaries. Um, and and uh, the second statement actually is different from the first in that it allows browsers to trim any layer or prune any layer. So that matches up limitations. It's just that they would have to wait until the answer to expose it. And by doing so, they avoid having extra state that they need to ro roll back. So the proposal is to stop here and close this issue. And that uh, implementations would have to fix the remaining bugs. Any objections? All right, I'm not hearing anything, so that's good. Uh, that's my time. Thanks. All right, so uh, we have a few issues regarding data channels but are mostly described in uh, WebRTC extensions at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. So um, at the moment, we have uh, RTC data channel that is uh, transferable. So set algorithm 
is mentioning that we need to check the max message size of the channels associated RTC SCTP transport um, to know if we can send a message. The max message size uh, is a slot on RTC SCTP transport and it can be updated re during renegotiation. So asynchronously, if we have data channels that are transferred to workers, but not the SCTP transport object, then we can end up in a situation where we renegotiate on the main uh, thread, update the max message size, and that change is not necessarily directly visible to a worker that is trying to send. So uh, it is a problem. There are a few different uh, solutions that are possible to fix that, and uh, I have them on the next slide. So a few solutions. Um, there's a possibility that we agree that uh, we don't want to change the max message size during renegotiation. It's not something that seems to be happening in practice. Um, it happens during negotiation that the values are adjusted, but it does. it's not renegotiated. So if the value is fixed, we should probably uh, update the specification to say that it cannot be changed, which means that we could, during the transfer, copy the value of the SCTP transport max message size into the data channel object, and that the data channel object will have the value available, and the send algorithm will uh, be quick to run because it's a synchronous method, and um, it will be will be fine. So that's point one. Point two is that when we can transfer a data channel uh, at any point uh, before it's used, which means that the SCTP transport might not be created yet. We can, it's perfectly fine to uh, create a new per connection, create a data channel directly, even before doing negotiation. Which so uh, we don't have a value for max message size that is available um, to copy into the transferred object. Um, so we have an issue there that we have we still have an object that has a value that is going to be updated max message size on the transport when it's created, and an object that is in a different thread and uh, they will need to have some communication to get updated about the value or we need to agree that send is going to be blocking uh, hop threads and um, to read the max message size or something like that so a solution that i would think would be to add um, language to um, update um, announcing a data channel as open algorithm to um, make sure that at this during the that algorithm we notify the object on the worker thread uh, that there is a new value for max message size well there is a value for max message size so the first value if it's been transferred before and with the value and then data channel could live on with its own value that is never going to be updated. So those are two different things, and I'd like to discuss that. Dom? Uh, yes, how confident are we that uh, freezing max message say, size in renegotiation is web compatible? Um, we asked people at TPAC, we didn't seem to think that it was something that was needed. We need to make uh, some checks about that, but it doesn't seem like to be uh, to be a very uh, competing feature uh, that people rely on. But for sure, we need to make uh, some checks about that. At the moment, uh, in any case, if you try to send 
in current implementations, uh, in some current implementations, if you try to send a message that is bigger than max message size, you will terminate the peer connection, um, the data channels. So, uh, it, and it will return an error because the message to be reached out uh, to the lower level. So, um, people already need to make sure that uh, they don't send too big of messages because they cannot get an error. So, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. But we can run some checks in your versions to see if we have uh, changes in of max message size and renegotiation. So if, if I remember the ellipse, Bernard has on the queue. Yeah, I, I think the only time you would see this, Flaunt, is if, like, in some weird maintenance scenario where they were replacing an implementation. I, I, I think it's pretty rare that you'll ever see a max message size renegotiated. I believe so. We can uh, add some uh, measurements to see if that happens in uh, in Chrome, and um, can move forward uh, with any decision. I, I would still like to know what we should do about um, a max message size that um, that it lives on an object that is on a different thread than where it's used copying of the max message size as part of the notification seems yeah. Being a hidden, yeah a hidden attribute of the event some seems like a reasonable thing to do yeah i think both your solutions are sounds good if they are web compatible so. yeah uh we still have an issue of a renegotiation that would change the value and then you would have a mismatch um between if we allow negotiation uh, that changes max message size, we would have a mismatch between what the transport is configured for and what the data channel is allowing. And possibly the transport will have a smaller message size, which means that some messages might be rejected. So yeah, uh, just to be so clear. Negotiating I... up is no problem. Negotiating down is problem. Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if freezing the value is compatible, then we should do that <laughs> and make this problem simpler. So I'm not at all opposed at all, as long as we make sure that we're not going to break stuff. Right. So we could go on with uh, copying the, um, with announcing the value for sure. And then copying the value, we will need to um, probably notify either you can add an issue about uh, renegotiation while we measure uh, in, pro in implementations to see if that happens. And if it doesn't happen, then we can make sure that we have uh, the, a value that is copied and not deleted. OK. Well, so that um, sorry, Jan over here. Uh, so, so far the slides are talking about internal slots, but we're, are we talking about exposing an API for max message size on the data channel? I did not. We could add that. Because mm. uh, I think that would be... Sorry, uh, the value would be the same for all uh, data channels uh, from the same uh, transport. Mm -hmm. So it was considered not necessary um, when we didn't consider transfer um, data channels because you would have access to probably to the peer connection and then the SCTP transport and read the value from there. Uh, for simplicity and uh, considering a data channel transfer, it might be easier to have the value also readable on, um, on the data channel knowing that if you have a negotiated, you might have uh, an undefined value. It's something okay. I can do. Yeah, it's not clear from the, the slides whether you're proposing just uh, language to update internal slots or new API. I thought I heard exposing something in, the, in, in an event, and I think uh, design principles usually prefer that we don't add 
data in the event exposed to JavaScript, but instead have it be a property on the target event target. Right. So, uh, it's uh, right. what I uh, considered uh, updating uh, internal slots, adding internal slots, and uh, updating them in the open event. Um, and then when you get your data channel is open event, you can. Uh, you could uh, your max message size slot uh, pro for the data channel would have the proper value and possibly an accessor to read it. But well, you you, you you would need it, right? Or you would have to also have the PCs and uh, max message size information at the same time, which would be clunky. Yes, it, it would be very clunky if we didn't have it, definitely. And it's a very minor addition, uh, so definitely worth it especially in the transfer data channel uh, situation. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. It sounds good. It would uh, definitely help things. And uh, we'll measure in Chrome uh, to see what happens. All right. Uh, so next issue, um, which is one that uh, Yanivar created, uh, we have in the language regarding uh, transferred data channels, um, we uh, an extension of the interface for uh, transferable, and the HTML spec says that we should have a detached internal slot on uh, the transferable platform objects, which we don't have. We have instead an is transferable slot, which is a little bit different, which needs to be guarding against having um, a data channel that is transferable after we already started sending from it, uh, which is a, a little bit of a overlap, not quite. I suggest that uh, we add um, the data slot to match the HTML specification, and we update the algorithms uh, that we describe regarding uh, data channel transferability to actually use it and that we also keep is transferable to prevent transferring uh, data channels on which we have called sent. So effectively, it would be just internal um, specification updates, but the behavior would probably be the same where um, data channel transfer has been implemented. So. Any objections in that? Uh, no objection, just a, a comment that uh, I think uh, data channels, uh, when they're transferred, um, it, it's actually still woefully unspecified what happens to the object that remains on the main thread. And uh, I think we will. OK. That's the next slide. So there's uh, uh, one. Uh, so there was one issue regarding uh, detached slots. And next slide, uh, still for the same issue. Uh, we have we we talked about um, uh, different points about uh, data channels, and we are not sure if uh, a transfer data channel should be eligible for uh, garbage collection. What happens to an object after it's been transferred? Um, there's still an object on the current thread, and uh, it needs to be in some state. And uh, right now, in the specification, the state is closed. And uh, that means that this data channel would uh, probably be garbage collected if there was no strong reference to it. Um, so is this a problem? Do we want to do anything about it? Or do we want to reflect that the object has been um, transferred somewhere and then, for example, introduce a new state from connecting open, closing, closed, a detached, or maybe some other state somewhere, a Boolean, uh, that would say this detachional is detached and uh, it lives on somewhere else. And uh, then garbage collection algorithm could be updated to say if it's detached, make sure that uh, only close it, um, only garbage collect if the transfer data channel to your other end living in the worker thread um, is closed. There are a few 
issues there and it's not really clear because I haven't worked a lot with transferable objects here. What is your sentiment? Uh, I personally like proposal two better and the reason is um, first of all I, I think could proposal two allow you to use uh, get data channels and see the detached ones so that's the next slide <laughs> <laughs> but, they're all a little bit uh, intertwined yes yeah and the other thing is um, garbage collection tends to wreak a lot of havoc with jitter and stuff, so I actually might uh, might be good to not have them be garbage collected. Um, anyway, so I lean towards proposal two. So I, I think that uh, we still have a lot of work to specify. Uh, so transferable objects aren't magic, and they actually rely on. Uh, they're actually more like a clone. Right. You don't actually transfer the object so much as you leave a um, a sort of clone that no longer works works behind. Uh, and there's a movie I won't spoil it for you where there's a transporter and the rest of the movie you spend trying to kill your clones. But anyway, um, I think we need to specify um, other objects that are transferable. They end up having uh, all their algorithms modified. To look, if this is if detached is true, then abort these steps. And we haven't added that yet. So there's a question for the group here. How should these main thread objects that are left behind work? And I think um, whether they're garbage collected or not, they wouldn't be because you could still have strong references to them. And um, it, it, that seems like a secondary question. Uh, but the, the primary question to me is, how do these objects behave? What happens if you read their attributes um, in, and those kind of the, things? In this specific case, uh, since the current state uh, in the specification is closed. If you try to call any function on it, there's two, only two functions, uh, close and send. Um, close will say, if it's already closed, don't do anything, it's done. And uh, send will uh, throw an invalid state error if you are in closed state, which matches yeah. Yeah. what uh, a detached slot would do if it was true on most of our APIs. Cool. So that the behavior would be the same as it, as it is implemented. It would just be clear that if it's detached, then you throw this. And uh, we can probably go back to this if we have time at the end, uh, because now it's a lot of time to speak. So do we do we have a good decision? I believe uh, change for uh, proposal to introduce a detached state for um, yes data channels and um, make sure that we have a, a trans detached internal slot and update yeah. algorithms as a first step. <coughs> yep, that's that actually. And then we continue discussion on. Get data channels on the garbage collection behavior? Um, depends on Elad if you have enough time, or maybe we can do that uh, at the end. Uh, I, I think, think there's just enough time, so I can donate a bit to you. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Otherwise, we discuss on GitHub. Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, we're here to uh, discuss Capture Handle again and uh, a couple of extensions that I would like us to make. Uh, so just a quick reminder for people who have forgotten who were or, or who were not here uh, when we discussed this previously. Capture Handle is a mechanism by which a captured page sets some kind of string and maybe also exposes its origin to whichever uh, other tab might end up capturing it. So for example, uh, I could say, hey, uh, ABC, and also expose my origin. And then if anybody ends up capturing me, they get to read ABC. And uh, why this is interesting is that I could, for example, say, hey, uh, my IP address is XYZ. And you know, if you want to communicate with me, try there. And Meet and Slides, for example, could use that to for Meet to detect, hey, I'm capturing a slides presentation. How about I start doing interesting things? Next slide, please. So some of the things that uh, you could do with this is you could remote control a presentation. 
Uh, but unlike, for example, capture actions, you could also remote control anything, right? So we're already talking about a new mechanism that would allow you specifically to capture, uh, to control a presentation more easily. Uh, but if you can actually start communicating um, in any way that you choose with whatever you're capturing, you could do anything. You could send any type of message. Uh, the sky's the limit. Uh, but some of the things that I would like us to discuss today are how you could tailor the encoding to match the content type and how you could crop to regions of interest in the captured tab. Next slide, please. So the reason that I would like um, uh, the reason that I would like us to discuss this is that I think that there are a couple of uh, gaps in the uh, API as currently specified, and that we need to plug those gaps. So first of all, um, it is unstructured, right? So anybody can choose to uh, structure their data in any way they want. So for example, let's take slides. Slides could say, hey, here's my IP, and I, or it could say, hey, my IP is here, or it could say, you can imagine, right? It could structure it in any way. Um, another problem is that you can actually only work with strings. So if we go back two slides, please. Thank you. Then we will notice that there is json.stringify here and json.parse. And while that is often very uh, sufficient, sometimes it's not, for example, for crop targets. Uh, three slides forward, please. So I uh, think that is two, so one more, please. No, sorry, that is uh, correct by mistake, sorry. Uh, yes, so uh, let's start talking about these uh, problems. So number one is content hitch, right? So for example, if I'm being, uh, if slides end up, ends up being captured, uh, it wants to let uh, the video conference in application know that it's static, static content or video. And it wants to do that in a way that would be uh, useful to any kind of video conferencing tool, right? Not just for uh, Meet. And the problem is that if you can set any kind of string, you don't really know, okay, so it's like the video conferencing tool doesn't know where to look for that information. And specifically, the way that we want to use this is with something called content hint, right? There is a way that a capture, um, somebody that's transmitting a uh, video or audio can say, hey, uh, in the case of an imperfect network, prefer to degrade resolution or prefer to degrade frame rate, right? So uh, in the case of static content, you would prefer to uh, degrade frame rate first, right? In the case of motion, you would most likely prefer to degrade resolution. Uh, and there's an analogous uh, trade-off for audio. Next slide, please. Um, so as you can see, uh, we don't really uh, know where to look for the uh, content. And that gives us problem number one, structured versus unstructured. Uh, tightly coupled applications don't really care if it's structured or unstructured, they impose their own structure, right? If Meet sees that uh, it's capturing slides, it knows uh, which uh, protocol slides uses, but other applications don't. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is for uh, other arguments that have come up for this specific use case. I think this is not really uh, needed right now because this is specifically, I'm just trying to explain the difference between structured and unstructured, but if need be, we can go back to that and people can refer back to that if necessary. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, uh, we've got a couple of, uh, that's one use case, right? Uh, capture handle and content hint. Another one is crop target. Next slide, please. So in this case, we see two tabs, one on the left, one on the right. The one on the right is capturing the one on the left, and the one on the left is YouTube. Now, if I were to share all of this uh, tab, it's going to be a bit embarrassing for me because, well, I'm actually trying to just share the video of uh, Rick Astley, but I see that there's the playlist there, and there's going to be a couple of um, ads tailored specifically for me. And maybe there are even some comments that I've already started drafting. And all of those are things that I don't actually want to share remotely. And it would be nice if a video conference and application could help me avoid sharing all of that. Next slide, please. So for that, we actually have uh, 
a mechanism called region capture. And that mechanism allows you to say, hey, I only want, I want to crop the video to this uh, content area. The problem is that it only works for self-capture right now because or for same origin uh, tabs. Self, uh, same origin tabs can transmit a crop target over a broadcast channel. Others can't. So how would this be useful? So we've got a simple mock application here, right? Imagine that you're a video conferencing application. First thing you do is you say, hey, what have I captured? Does it have any crop targets, right? If it has any crop targets, you can cycle through them, produce one frame of each one, and present that to the user as thumbnails. And now the user can say like, no, it, the user can either say, hey, I actually want to capture the entire thing, transmit all of this remotely, stay out of my hair. Or the user can say like, yeah, great. Actually, you see this? Just the video, that's what I want to share remotely. And the video conferencing can then uh, work on behalf of the user. And that's what would we would be able to do if we could actually transfer crop targets. Next slide, please. As mentioned, it's not string uh, stringable. And also, if it were stringable, we would still run into the original problem of like, OK, great, it's a string. Where do I find it among all of the other strings? Next slide, please. So uh, what I think we should do is we should probably impose some structure, some additional structure on the capture hand. If we were to say, hey, uh, there, is, there are a couple of fields that are always there. You can use them, you cannot use them, right? Uh, if you want to use them, here's a place where you could put the crop targets. And each crop target can, you know, we can annotate it with a name. Uh, we can annotate it with metadata. We could even say that the, uh, the suggested content hit, content hit is specific to that particular region. Next slide, please. Uh, actually, sorry, let's go back one. I think that the last slide is like a different topic, so uh, let's get back to that later. Um, so what do you think? All right, I don't see anyone on the queue, so I'm going to put myself on a queue. Um, you do have a, a slide after that uh, seems to answer some of my questions, the one after this one. What about a message port? So a uh, message uh, port, the, the, uh, what about a message port? There is a very simple answer. It's not structured. If it's not structured, it means that, yeah, it's going to work just great for Meet and for Slides. What about Meet and Zoom? I'm uh, sorry, Zoom and Slides. What about Meet and Word, uh, Meet and PowerPoint? Yes. All of those combinations are not going to work. So I, I would, uh, as someone who pushed for set capture actions, I would actually suggest we use a message port here because it, it feels to me like we're getting too much into the space of uh, specific applications. And I don't think we necessarily know. Um, I'm not sure we want to be in the business of specifying all, all the different things um, that an um, that application might need. Um, there's some, yeah, I do agree there's some benefit in that it could uh, allow innovation across um, presentation products and uh, 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 video conferencing products, but it's still not clear to me um, how far we need to go to um, to cover all the use cases. And um, I also believe I've given this feedback back in February. That's issue eleven. That's basically titled "Don't Reinvent Post Message." So uh, these slides are useful, and I think uh, they show that there are a lot of potential use cases for this. And um, but I think at the end of the day, um, and sorry, that issue 11 also uh, highlights some some issues with the set config handle, set capture handle config, uh, in that the handle can be used as a messaging channel already, uh, because it's not well specified uh, that you can't update this continuously and basically create your own channel. So if I could just. Um, uh... So if right. I could reiterate some of my responses uh, to these uh, arguments delivered in the past so that uh, people who are here would also know my counter arguments. Counter argument number one, uh, a message port requires that the uh, 
capture inform the capture of the presence of the capture, right? The moment I send you a message saying like, hey, um, you know, what's your suggested content hint? Then you immediately know that I'm capturing you because that's the only way you could get that message. That's number one. Uh, number two is uh, you've mentioned that this is uh, that the capture handle itself is a message board, but unidirectional, and that is correct. Uh, but that is okay. Uh, and the reason that it is okay is that it's very useful because, for example, right now we're seeing uh, Google Slides on our screens, and each slide is going to be slightly different, right? So to set the handle in the at the beginning of the capture, right, is not really useful. What happens if the next slide shows a video? What happens if the next slide shows a GIF? Those things are, so we actually need to be able to change the capture handle. Now, I agree that sometimes we do want a message board, and that's why I've got a slider. I think a message board is going to be very useful, but I think it's an uh, orthogonal use case. Uh, it's a use case. Uh, the use case here is when you've got tightly, uh, uh, tightly coupled applications, two applications that know each other, agree on a protocol, and know when, how to send each other messages, know what the messages need to be structured like. Right, uh, yeah, so I, I would just take a step back and, and uh, ask what the requirements are. And if the requirement is to, uh, is the requirement uh, solved by a message port uh, or, um, uh, so what, what is the actual surface that is being proposed here? So uh, what I'm uh, suggesting, uh, I'm making uh, three different suggestions here. Suggestion number one is I want to be able to uh, transfer region capture, I'm sorry, crop targets on the capture handle itself. Okay, right now it's a string. Uh, we might want to change it to something other than a string. Then it will, for example, be a dictionary and that could include region uh, crop targets. Uh, that's going to be suggestion number one. That's going to work for me. Suggestion number two is I'm say, I want to say, hey, uh, okay, so that works great for tightly coupled applications. What about loosely coupled applications? They also want to transfer crop targets. Uh, so how about we also uh, designate a place where crop targets usually go? If you want, you could still uh, put crop targets elsewhere in the normal handle. But, but everybody knows that, hey, crop targets can go here. That's a good place to look. Uh, sorry, that's number two. Number three is I want to do the same for uh, suggest, uh, suggested content hint. And I'm sorry, I lied to you before. It's not three, it's four. Number four is I want to add a message board uh, to make life easier for tightly coupled applications. And my apologies for not ma making it clearer over the slides that there are four different suggestions here. Um. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm on the queue. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, I, I think the use cases seem uh, very relevant. Um, I, I do wonder if what we want is a unidirectional message port, if that's not what we should be doing, and then having it bidirectional in some circumstances. Um, I, I guess what resonates with me in Yaniva's argument is that uh, if we have to decide each and every way we want capture and capturers to coordinate, uh, this may create a lot of uh, churn for progress. Whereas if we provide uh, an open communication channel, maybe with some ways of uh, documenting you know, well-defined protocols for it changes and this might create less uh, less churn so I mean I guess uh, I'm not opposed to to what you described there but I, I feel that there may be a sweeter spot for uh, loosely coupled applications to work one with another oh, yes uh, so again my apologies for not making it clear uh, and what I'm trying to argue here is that we need a couple of uh, orthogonal APIs for orthogonal use cases. And for the case of um, tightly coupled applications, we're already running into the problem that we cannot transfer anything except for streams. Uh, streams. And I'm arguing that we need to change the, uh, the field from a string to an object. So um, that's number one, and like that's my top priority. Number two is I'm arguing that uh, 
just like capture actions does not seek to uh, like loosely coupled applications will not be able to do everything. They'll be able to do a very small uh, subset of you know potential things, and we're we're gonna have to be able to support those for them. Just like Yaniva is working on capture actions for next and previous, and next and previous are by no means enough to cover everything an application would want to do, but it's already very useful. And I think that the same can be said for a place to put a, a content hint and a place to put region capture, uh, crop targets. And yes, there will be additional uh, suggestions in the future, and we will have to evaluate them on their merits. So um, let, let's start with the uh, with the first uh, suggestion. Uh, what does the working group think about changing the handle, which is currently a string, into an object? So, uh, yeah, Eva, uh, I don't think any. Yes. Yes, uh, I didn't see anyone else on the queue, so uh, I'll speak again. Uh, so yeah, I would reiterate issue 11, don't reinvent post message. And I think uh, uh, the the concern here is that I, uh, it's kind of like creating a message channel that someone may or may not be listening to. Um, and I'm not sure that we should build that much application on top of it. But that is intentional. And the intentionality is that YouTube does not actually need to know if it's being captured by Zoom or by Teams or by Meet, and you've yourself uh, in the past uh, worried about self-censorship, you know, and this does away with this. This means that if YouTube allows Meet to, uh, you know, to capture it uh, in a good way, then any other video conferencing tool can just read that, read the same thing and do the same thing. Right. Uh, yeah, it's just a, there's a lot to comment on here. And uh, I'm, I'm, for instance, I'm not sure um, uh, if you're adding API surface in a browser, you normally expect the browser to to react to it. And in this case, you might be specifying all your capture handles, but there's really no guarantee that anything, it's not the browser that's going to react on these capture handles. They're just going to be surface, I, I think I'm understanding, to the capturing application, which may or may not do anything with these. Correct. And, and that seems a little odd to me why we're involved with just basically carrying information across in an anonymous way without actually acting on it. Um, I mean, you could argue it's the same way with set capture actions going the other way, but uh, it's it's a little more formalized, I think, in that case, what will happen. I, I, I um, do argue that this is the same, and I argue that it's not at all more formalized because all you're delivering mm -hmm. to Google Slides is, hey, somebody said next, but it can interpret next in any way it wishes. Uh, so it's not actually yes. more formalized, but I'm sorry. I think that Harold is on the queue. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a, a question for Dom, really. But uh, do we have any tradition of uh, establishing uh, standardized protocols over message ports? That is uh, saying that uh, these are these are these are messages that you can pass across a message port if you agree to follow this uh, this protocol. I missed the start of the question. Are you asking whether there are existing similar protocols? Yeah. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I would have to investigate. So because uh, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, if we add message port and we have structured data over message port in a way that says, uh, okay, I'm a, uh, if you can say, okay, I'm a, I'm a, I'm something that looks like a presentation. Please control me with next time so forward and so on. Uh, it would seem logical to collapse all the other stuff into messages sent across the message port instead of, as uh, Jan Ivar keeps repeating, in inventing message port again. Yeah, that's exactly if, what if I If there's no such, uh, no such tradition, then we are establishing something new, and I feel much more scared. Yeah, I mean, I, I think ultimately this is 
kind of what we are doing one way or the other. Like either we're doing it through message port or we're doing it through capture handle. Um, so uh, I think, yeah, yeah. Bo both feel the same level of scariness. But but I agree the path is more well better paved if there are other similar protocols out there. I, I can certainly check that. So um, from my side, I uh, I took to heart um, past criticism that uh, this API is only useful for or most useful for uh, tightly coupled applications. I came up with uh, a bunch of uh, suggestions that address loosely coupled applications. And uh, it pains me that um, the working group is, has not become more amenable to those uh, proposals because of that. Uh, but uh, that stated, if we could at least uh, change the from string to an object, I think that we're going to address, at least for tightly coupled applications, all of the use cases that uh, are important uh, for me. And I think that's going to be a good start. So I wonder whether there are any arguments for keeping uh, a, uh, the handle a string and not just making it string or object. So first of all, let me reiterate, I, I do feel that any improvements that we can make in uh, the mechanisms working better for loosely coupled API, uh, applications feels uh, a big improvement. Again, uh, I, I guess I wonder if we have, if your proposal is the best approach to do that, but, but the, the intent I fully support just to be extra clear on this. Uh, on the string versus object, um, I guess, would that be, I guess where I'm struggling is what if in your object you have something that cannot be transferred to, I mean, like, would that be only serializable objects? Only or? serializable objects, yes. Okay. I mean, I, I, at that level, that, that sounds fine to me. Yeah. So for me, that's oh. the minimum uh, suggestion. And I think that it works even if we go with other suggestions later. So I would like to put that to a vote. I, I don't think uh, we're, we're in the process. I don't think a vote is the right next step on this. Uh, the, the concerns we have with capture handle, I think, are. Uh, uh, I'm not sure going from a string to a, an object. The original purpose of handle was presented as uh, an identifying an, an identifier, right? And now we're talking about passing um, objects over it. And I don't think that that fits with the original narrative of of the API. And if if it's going to be, so it sounds like if we want, I mean. I could be wrong, but I think you can actually post message something and you don't actually know if anyone's listening, right? I can use um, it over a broadcast channel, but what happens if uh, there is uh, storage partitioning? How can I do it from YouTube to Meet? <clears throat> right, and that is the use case I think we should try to explore solving. I'm not sure taking a, a handle that was supposed to be an identifier and turning it into object is the so uh, I think we've been it. exploring this. Like I think that this was presented in TPEC, and I've not heard any alternatives yet. I've come up with several suggestions so far, and what I'm hearing is, hey, why don't we just use um, a message board for everything? Mm -hmm. And my argument is that the message board, uh, if we go to slide number fifty-one, please, oh, we are already there, right? So I was actually preparing to explain why a message board is even necessary because the last time what I heard was like, hey, why do we even need that? Um, <clears throat> Sorry, um, yes. So uh, a message port does not address uh, all of the use cases that we have uh, mentioned before, because A, it requires the capture to expose itself, right? So that's number one. And uh, number two, it is not structured, which means that, okay, it only works for uh, tightly coupled applications. I've not heard anything better yet. So unless, so nobody has mentioned that this is not an interesting problem to solve. Uh, nobody has mentioned the better solution for it, and uh, we've now discussed it two times. So, what's the next step? And well, I think um, maybe we could try offline to to work out some of the immediate use cases. Uh, and it sounds like uh, one of them, as to what uh, we need some. Uh, 
clear requirements. I think I'm a little lost on how many of these we're solving it with one API. And it so sounded I'll... like uh, instead of having a handle, why not just have a, I think you proposed this in the past, having a separate field for uh, for a crop target. Uh, that is also uh, in one of the slides, yes. Yes. So, but I think we're trying a lot of different approaches here, and I think we need to come up with a, and I'm not sure. I want to explain. I, well, just, I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just, just say that I'm not sure we should. I'm not sure we should solve uh, random websites specifying crop targets. Uh, I'm sorry? So it, I'm not sure we should allow uh, random websites to specify crop targets. I'm not sure that's a, why, that's why a good not? use case. So I, I've just. Uh, by the way, this is. If you look at slide forty-seven, please. Yeah. I tailored it especially for you because you've several times in the past mentioned that you're worried that the website would set a crop target that ends up being a single pixel or even less, and that this would kind of trick uh, video conferencing application. And if you dive into the code of uh, slide forty-seven, this one, you will see that the process is purely user-driven. So it is possible for a video, it's very easy for a video conferencing application to structure it in such a way that the user could not be tricked. Uh, okay, but um, yeah, this is. Um... I, I can explain again what it does if you don't mm -hmm. want to read the code right now. Basically, it cycles through all of the crop targets produces mm -hmm. thumbnails, shows the user the thumbnails, then the user chooses. Now, it is true that we can construct crazy websites that are not useful at all and somehow manage to trick the user. But for a normal, useful website like YouTube, it's going to have a single crop target, and then the user is going to choose between, hey, do I want to share all of the website or just this region of the website? And that's going to be very useful for the users. And I think that... Um, this useful use case is much more interesting than theoretical possibilities that are very easy to uh, to protect against. I, I think I'm saying that I'm not really sold on. I'm I'm personally not sold on that we need to solve this for random websites. Uh, That's really my feedback. You, if you want to, if you want to restrict some functionality to something other than random websites, you need to specify. You you need to come up come up with at least a hint of a mechanism that will allow the browser to 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 tell the difference between a random website and a non-random website. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes, I, I meant that we, we've also discussed here uh, potentially opening a message port and that would reveal uh, a two-way uh, communication channel, right? At that point, uh, the gig is up that you are being captured. And at that point, uh, it seems a lot of these use cases could be solved. Wouldn't that only make it more likely that uh, that the, the capturing we a captured website would start up employing trickery? Like when it knows who's capturing it, it has somebody it might want to actually trick. Beforehand, it might be tricking something you know from this very same provider. Uh, yes, but it depends on what the yeah. I I'm again having trouble seeing how um i mean you're showing here how a capturing application might present thumbnails but it's not necessarily how it would I'm sorry, happen. but we, we're unable to uh to foolproof the web uh, we cannot make sure that video conferencing tools cannot be written in a bad way and can mm -hmm. never do the wrong thing like sure like we want to avoid foot guns mm -hmm. but there is a limit right so i don't want to take up everyone's time but uh, i don't support handle being an object I don't think a compelling case has been shown uh, why you wouldn't want to do that. And it's not clear to me what kind of objects you could pass through this way. And couldn't that be targets. a security concern? OK, so, um, so is there a reason why uh, YouTube should not be able to send the crop target to something at meet.google.com, for example? Or is that the, an interesting use case that should uh, should be solved. And by the way, I use Google products just you know out of convenience. Of course, I mean with all of the corollaries for other providers. No, I think that's a good use case. We should figure out a way to do that, and okay. maybe we could. Uh, is there you know, a, is there a timeline for that, uh, or like a schedule? Is there a because we've well, this is the second time we're discussing this. There are do you uh, will you come up with something by the third? time or what's going to happen next? 
I'm sorry, this is not the right forum for process questions like that. Okay, uh, so I'll opinion. come up with a suggestion. It has been mentioned, uh, you've mentioned that you don't like this suggestion, uh, this proposal, but I'm not hearing an alternative mm -hmm. other than let's just use a message board, but it is clear why a message board is insufficient. Well, it is clear why the message port required at the moment, as far as I can tell at the moment, it's clear why a message port has implications that that make it uh, not necessarily the best solution. So I see two proposals at the moment. It's uh, make prop target an object with uh, specific specific fields that are useful for specific purposes. And it's uh, the this uh, construct a message port, which allows tightly bound uh, applications to do anything. Um, these are independent meant, things. I think you meant handle. You said crop target. Yeah, capture handle. I'm talking about ca capture handle. Ca capture handle is suggested to be able to contain a crop target, not not the other, not the other way around. But the, there is there are two se two separate proposals here, and uh, we need to say that uh, I uh, I think we should regard them as independent. And for either one, we need to say we should pursue this further or we should not and uh, yes we need to we need to come up uh, we can't just go on discussing this forever exactly so uh, I'm not hearing uh, a reason against making the handle an object here except for any bar and by the way, I would also like to mention that making that uh, the handle an object is also the lowest complexity option of the bunch, and also the less, least scary compared to uh, adding a message port. But obviously, there is also engineering challenges both in producing that as well as using that. Whereas if you just need to set an object and then the other side reads that, that's lower complexity than message ports. So I suggest that we start with that and proceed with the message port later. Yeah, it depends on the complexity of the object, of course. Correct. But generally, it's easier to set an object and to read it than to set an object inside of a message. Especially so if you are, you are you proposing that any platform object could be assigned to a handle? Any serializable object. Uh, that seems a bit... Uh, uh, is that safe? And, and that would be uh, surface to the capture? Yes, that doesn't it would seem be safe. a surface to all capturers. And there could have actually be multiple ones. <clears throat> that seems problematic to me from a web security perspective. Why is that? Uh, because uh, it's any object. It's not just JavaScript objects, but it could be platform objects no, that uh, carry uh, so personal anything information. That you could, anything that you could transmit over a message port. So there's not going to be a difference here. In fact, probably less than you could transmit over a message port because uh, not transferable objects, only serializable objects. I see. OK. So if anything, I think that the security profile here is better. Um, yeah. I, I think we'd have to think about that. So Ben is on the queue. Yeah, I'm just wondering if it's an arbitrary object. Couldn't you cause the receiver to, for example, run out of memory by Thank setting you. Uh, a really large object? Yes, so that is actually one of the uh, considerations I've had, and I've discussed this with Chrome security. And uh, my argument was, um, so I came up with the uh, argument with this uh, uh, problem as well as uh, that's basically why we had a limit on the string length to begin with. And then I uh, came back and I said, I think I was overzealous here. I don't think this is a credible attack because the captured uh, page would be attacking before it even knew whom it was attacking. And it would be incurring the same cost itself that it imposes on the uh, 
on whatever it's attacking. And uh, Chrome security uh, agreed with me, it's not a credible attack and it's not a problem. Are there other similar objects, you know, that can be a problem for the receiver that uh, is not necessarily a problem for the sender? If uh, there are such objects, I'm not aware of them. Um, and I guess if a website just doesn't want to be captured at all, isn't this something that they could do to avoid being captured? I don't think that's likely because most pages are not captured most of the time. They would be, uh, basically, they would be taking on a huge cost to themselves so that they may somehow attack something that could, emit, could, that could just ignore it and that most likely does not even exist. Well, so I mean, there could be social engineering for that, right? I mean, like you could make a website say, oh, share me with uh, this or that, and this or that creates an interesting attack. Like, I, it's not just about random sharing. Social engineering can influence who gets to share what. So one of the things we could do to mitigate that if it becomes an issue is we could make sure that, oh, I'm sorry, we've already got that. So uh, currently you don't actually look at the handle until you call get capture handle. Uh, and what we could do is to say that, hey, just make sure that you don't get any memory, like nothing happens until you call get capture handle. Uh, it's gonna be problematic in that get capture handle currently is a sync call and that would have to make it blocking, but that would be our way out of things if we see that it's ever becomes uh, an attack, but I would, I think, I, I think it's very unlikely to ever become an attack vector. So, the original purpose of a uh, capture handle was to be able to identify the capturee, so that an out of bound communication channel could be established. Is that right? No, that was one of the yeah, one of the purposes. I think there were a list. There was a list of like five different use cases in the explainer, and that's just one of them. And that was one of them. Yes. So it sounds like YouTube and applications uh, that are communicating should already have the mechanism in place then that they need to transfer a capture handle. I thought this was a solved problem. So maybe we time. should look at stringifying uh, the capture handle. Then. So Another something that I've already suggested and that this working group rejected. So we, we're running out of time. Can we just figure out how to make progress on this without waiting until a future turn? Yes, please. So uh, uh, currently, I'm only hearing one person actually objecting to making the handle a string or object. Uh, ben, I'm sorry, I thought that you just raised it as a question. Uh, do you formally object to this or? Uh, just giving some uh, food for thought. Okay. So, so far, it looks like uh, Yanivar is the only one that's objecting this. And I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we need. I'm sorry, we, we need to, uh, we're not making decisions at that level at this point, and there's nothing formal about, uh, I don't think it's appropriate to ask for formal objections at this stage. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll move the word formal. Okay, no formal. No, so, uh, I mean, and just to be clear, I, at least some of the conversation, some of the questions raised about uh, the security implications, what exactly would make, would this make transferable that may not have been expected to be transferable? I mean, I, I don't know that there is an issue, but at least it gives me more questions than I had generally when I said I would probably be fine with an object. So, uh, I mean, I, 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 and I, again, you, I think you made also good arguments that, uh, in fact, the surface is similar to a message board. But, but I think like maybe having an explainer where you put all of that together into a consistent picture where you say which security issues you've actually looked into, where you think they don't apply, that, that may be a way to uh, as far as these questions. So, more text. 
I, mean, I think I mean, given that obviously we're not clear on the next step, uh, I, I guess this gets back to the chest to figure out uh, a path forward for you, Elad, uh, so that you don't remain stuck on this. Uh, I think that we are stuck here because I, I have no reason to believe that uh, putting all of this into an explainer is going to yield a different reaction. Uh, uh, and this may not be what the chair suggests. I'm just saying the chairs uh, need to own uh, the next steps on this. So okay. the so, so the collecting the arguments might give more participants the ability to say, "I understand this proposal and its implications." That's all that's positive about that particular proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're out of time and the chairs will discuss. We'll we'll get there somehow. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll stop the recording now and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye. Uh, does anyone